Okay, well, we're going to return to our discussion of Kripke's theory of naming. Last time we were looking at his main target, the descriptive theory, the theory that he finds in figures like Frege and Russell, as well as a variety of other theorists like John Searle. And the idea behind the descriptive theory, last time we listed it in terms of a number of theses. Today, instead, I'm going to draw a picture, okay? <laughs> we'll think about what it is for someone to actually use a name. So suppose this person says um, something that involves some name, M, let's say, um, as part of their speech. And what does the theory say about that name and how it functions? Well, first of all, there is associated with that name, or oh, there's some thought here that gets expressed by that, let's say. There is associated with that name some collection here. Um, I think in Kripke's way of doing it, this is a collection we just call X. But in any case, it's a set of, well, bits of information, you might say, about whatever the designation of that name is. So let's say the name is Aristotle, and then we've got something like the teacher of Alexander the Great, the most famous student of Plato, the author of the Nicomachean Ethics, the author of the Metaphysics, etc. Various things each of which alone might be a description, but at any rate, taken together, give us enough descriptive content to pin down the meaning of the name. So in addition to this, so here, here we have the name. <laughs> here we have this descriptive content that is associated with the name. And so far, nothing terribly controversial is going on. We're saying, look, the person's using a name. Presumably, there is some stuff. Those are supposed to be parentheses, by the way. That's not saying lame. <laughs> um, the idea is there's something they associate with that name, right? So you use a name, and I've never heard that person before, and I say, oh, who's that? And you start telling me who that is. You give me some descriptive content that you associate with the name. Now, what has to be true of that descriptive content for the name to refer? Well, first of all, the subject has to actually have a certain belief. So there must be here a belief which is that all of that designates some object unique. And secondly, it better be the case that this stuff does designate some object in the world unique. And assuming it does, so here is our object, <laughs> if it does designate an object uniquely, then the name actually refers to. Now, if it doesn't, that is to say, either if the subject doesn't have this belief, or if the descriptive content doesn't actually pick out an object uniquely, then the name doesn't work. Okay? And so, uh, in addition, once all that's taken place, then we can say, well, the, that the name, or the bearer of the name, has those properties mentioned in the descriptive content. That should be a priori and necessary. Because after all, that's part of what defines the name. And so, in the end, to say N uh, has this descriptive content X should give us something a priori as well as necessary. Now, last time we were surveying some reasons to worry about most of these claims. The idea that there's some descriptive content didn't seem especially controversial. But then the thought that the person had to believe that uniquely picked somebody out, we found some reasons to object to that. So why might one think, wait a minute, there might be descriptive content that's weak enough that it, even I don't think that picks out anyone unique. What were some examples we talked about? Does anyone remember? Yeah. The whole um, Schmidt-Gürtel thing? Well, the Schmidt-Gürtel thing is a case where the person does have a belief, but it picks out the wrong object. <laughs> um, and so actually, yeah, that more directly addresses this arrow, the one about you know, this designating a unique object, and if it does designate that object, that's the thing, the object the thing refers to. So over here we saw, yeah, there is this Gödel schmidt case where we end up saying, hold on a second, um, there is actually an object that uniquely satisfies the description, the, the, the person who proved the completeness and incompleteness theorems, but it's the wrong person. <laughs> um, and so in this case, it was sort of like not the case that there's not a unique referent. The problem is it's the wrong referent. So um, that was a case that had to do with that. What were some other cases that we talked about as cre creating problems with this theory? 
Um, there was a one physicist that Kripke was talking about, about how we only have like vague descriptions of the physicist, but we can sort of refer to him. Good, Richard Feynman, uh, example of a physicist. Now, some people know enough physics to actually be able to you know, characterize him uniquely. Um, what do you all, well, now that you've read Kripke, it's cheating, right? But um, who here thinks they could actually identify Richard Feynman uniquely? Not only say he's a physicist, but say, which physicist he is. Nobody. <laughs> Gosh. Well, I could do it really cheap. He's the author of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. <laughs> um, that's one way to do it. Another is, uh, oh yeah, he, he wrote a book on uh, the concept of physical law. Um, you might actually go into the details of his physical theories and the contributions he made. We might have ways of doing this, but probably for most people there isn't. If you know anything about Feynman at all, you know, oh, he's some physicist, right? And we talked about that possibility with respect to lots of people. Um, you know, who is so-and-so? Uh, who is Washington? Oh, he was a defensive player for the Cowboys in the 70s. Um, but you might not remember exactly uh, what position he played or very much about him. Not, you might not have descriptive information. And so there are those cases where we said, look, there's something vague. You might not even have the belief, right, that you can do this uniquely. So um, all of these are cases where we might have an indefinite description. Oh, he's a defensive cowboy player. Or um, he's a physicist. Or that's an author. Um, or, oh, yeah, an actor. Um, but it's very unclear which one that is. You might not be able at all to pin down that person uniquely. And yet, we want to say the name, as you use it, still refers to somebody, um, even though you have nothing but a sort of vague, sort of, uh, indefinite description to go along with it. Were there other cases we worried about as raising problems for this descriptive theory? Well, let's say, oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I don't know if we talked about it last time, but there was also the case where um, if Nixon didn't win the election, then um, although we refer to Nixon as being the winner of the election, then that wouldn't necessarily be Nixon anymore. Ah, good, good. So yes, we could think about Richard Nixon. And suppose you're identifying, you don't know much about Nixon. You just think, oh, he's the guy who won the presidential election in 1968. So Nixon is just the winner of the election in 1968. But then you think, well, Okay, that, this theory turns Nixon won the 1968 presidential election. That turns out to be knowable a priori, and for you anyway, and it turns out to be a necessary truth. But that seems ridiculous, right? <laughs> I mean, Humphrey could have won the 1968 election. It was a very close election. Moreover, there's something else that seems wrong with it. Suppose we're now thinking about another possible world where Humphrey did win the election. Then Humphrey would have been the winner of the 1968 election, but we don't want to say that in that world, Richard Nixon would refer to Hubert Humphrey, right? That's screwy. And so, in general, it seems like that's a case where we, we have a sort of unique referent, um, the winner of the 1968 presidential election, but it leads to real problems at this level. So, the Nixon-Humphrey case, which we didn't really talk about last time, we didn't get to the last bit of the the theory, but it looks like that creates real problems here. It looks like we get the wrong referent. It looks like we get a statement that's an empirical claim that easily could have turned out to be uh, false and the a priori unnecessary. And that seems bizarre. What other kinds of cases might worry us about this idea that what that if this all picks out something uniquely, then that's the referent? We've seen that can screw things up with the Gerdel Schmidt case. And in effect, when we move to another possible world, we've got a situation where we mess this up. But now, are there other kinds of cases where we do have something, let's say, that picks out an object uniquely, and yet, well, there are two things. Is this sufficient? And also, is this something that is necessary? What about a case where we think that we have a unique referent, so we think we can pin it down? It turns out that, let's say, it's not just um, an indefinite description. We think we've got uniquely identifying information, but actually we don't. What would be a case like that? I think I can actually characterize this person uniquely, but many people fit the description I give. Yeah? If you were to say, like, the person who invented calculus, if you called Newton that, then you didn't know Leibniz also invented 
Oh, okay, good, Newton, the inventor of the calculus. But wait a minute, Leibniz did that too, so you think that's a uniquely identifying description of Isaac Newton, and it's really not. And so in that case, when you use the term Isaac Newton, it doesn't refer, right? Um, we investigate your usage and say, well, most of you did correctly on the exam because you said that Newton did blah, 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 blah. But that guy, that guy didn't know about Leibniz. And if you got the Leibniz question wrong, then I'm sorry, you weren't referring when you, you gave your answer about Newton. So I have to mark that one incorrect as well. That would be bizarre, right? Wait, because I didn't know that about Leibniz, that he was a co-inventor of the captains, then my other answers about Newton are all wrong because I wasn't actually referring to anyone because I didn't. That would seem crazy, right? And so that's a good example where we have somebody like Newton characterized in a way that you think is unique, but it turns out it's not. And so, boom, it turns out on this view, there would be no referent at all. Yeah? Um, this might be kind of trivial, but like, I just found out that there was a Point Break remake, like a sequel, or really bad, apparently. But okay. um, for instance, if you didn't know Keanu Reeves, who he was, you could just say the star from, point, from the main protagonist from Point Break. And then I, I figure there's like people in my generation that haven't seen the original, but have only seen the new one, and thought I would be referring to the, the, the same names, I guess, remake, and not understand that I was referring to the original protagonist as opposed to the new one. All right, that's a great example. And in fact, that sort of thing arises whenever there are these kinds of remakes or... Think about the number of people who played Sherlock Holmes across history and so on. If somebody says, oh, the, the, the actor who played Sherlock Holmes, you could be referring to all sorts of people. And so, exactly, there are, there are lots of ways there of getting this wrong, where you've said something that you take to be uniquely identifying because you're not aware that there were all these other things, that this was a remake or that this was the original or that all sorts of people have actually done things on that character. And in that way, you end up actually, um, well... <laughs> thinking you've got a unique description, but it turns out not to be, and so it turns out you're not referring at all. Even though you're using the right name, you're referring to Keanu Reeves, or Basil Rathbone, or whoever it is, right, that you're, um, you're using the appropriate name, you're using it appropriately, and so on, and yet because you don't know about these remakes, or these earlier or later versions, then boom, it all blows up on you, and that seems ridiculous. Any other objections that you can frame to this theory? Well, then let's think about an alternative. Kripke basically looks at this and says, my point isn't so much that if we write this theory down precisely, things turn out to be false. That happens with a lot of philosophical theories. Um, as soon as you make them precise, something that seemed really interesting and, in fact, exciting, you make it precise, and then it looks like it's all false. And besides that, pretty boring. And so he says, look, maybe you can do this to any philosophical theory. At one point he says, I have a lot of sympathy with Bishop Butler's claim that each thing is what it is and not another thing, that philosophical analyses almost always fail, and so on. But he says, still, you have to look at them. You can't just turn the page and say, ah, well, philosophical analyses always fail, so this one's wrong too. Just skip along. But nevertheless, it's, there's something deeper wrong with this. It's not just that when you make it precise, a lot of it looks problematic. It's that it's the wrong picture of naming. This isn't how names work. And so Kripke gives us an alternative picture. He says, look, this isn't really a theory exactly, and maybe if you wrote it down precisely, it would look false too. But nevertheless, and by the way, that's what Gareth Evans, in effect, says in his paper on the causal theory of names, that, yeah, when you write it down precisely, it is all false. But before we get to that, Kripke says, think about an alternative. And to keep it clear that he is proposing it as a picture and not exactly a theory, let's call this the causal picture. Of me. <clears throat> so what's involved in the causal picture? Well, here is the way he actually describes it. <clears throat> Someone, let's say a baby, is born. His parents call him by a certain name. They talk about him to their friends. Other people meet him. <clears throat> Through various sorts of talk, the name is spread from link to link as if by a chain. A speaker who is on the far end of this chain, who has heard about, say, Richard Feynman in the marketplace or elsewhere, may be referring to Richard Feynman, even though he can't remember from whom he first heard of Feynman or from whom he ever heard of Feynman. He knows that Feynman is a famous physicist. A certain passage of communication, reaching ultimately to the man himself, does reach the speaker. He then is referring to Feynman even though he can't identify him uniquely. He doesn't know what a Feynman diagram is. He doesn't know what the Feynman theory of pair production and annihilation is. Not only that, he'd have trouble distinguishing between Gelman and Feynman, so he doesn't have to know these things, but instead a chain of communication going back to Feynman himself himself has been established. 
by virtue of his membership in a community which passed the name on from link to link. Not by a ceremony that he makes in private in his study. By Feynman, I shall mean the man who did such and such and such and such. Okay, so here's the picture. We have something that Kripke refers to technically as an initial baptism. Okay, so there is a baptism. Oops. <laughs> a naming, where the name gets introduced. And at that point, how does that work? Well, there's some object, let's say, the baby. Here's baby Feynman. <laughs> and it's a happy baby. And the parents introduce a name. Okay. Now, how does this get done? Well, sometimes it does, it happens directly and demonstratively. So the baby, the baby is right there, the parents say. The name of this baby will be, right? The nurse comes in and says, what's this baby's name? And you say, Richard Feynman, or whatever. And so you assign the baby a name directly. So this might happen to Monstrum. It might be right there. Of course, this also might happen descriptively. Because after all, we often name things we can't just point at directly. So it could be that we have a description. But now, what is this description doing? It is not giving us the meaning of the name, Kripke says. It is fixing the reference. It is telling us <clears throat> which object is being referred to. But it's not giving us anything like the meaning of the name. And it doesn't have to persist. It's really just the way we initially assign this. Okay? So maybe the parents, for example, actually assign the name before the baby's even born. And they can't ostend the baby and say that. They just say the baby we're going to have is going to be named. Yeah. Does it have to be uniquely identified? Does it have to be uniquely identified? Good question. Good question. How do, how would we think about that? Well, how, how can it be if there's so many common names? No, I mean, oh well, but <laughs> if, it's, if you're doing it descriptively, does the description have to be? Uh, Right, it's, yeah, it's not a question of whether the name is only the name of one thing. I mean, you can name another baby John Smith, and they're not going to throw it out. There are European countries where they're very careful about what names are permitted, and they don't allow parents to use certain names. I think in Iceland there are only a certain number of approvable names, and if anything else is impossible. Um, kind of authoritarian. Yeah, it is kind of authoritarian. <laughs> in the United States, I think more or less anything goes except for a few really extreme, obscene things. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, so would, would they let you if you wanted to name your baby F U such and such? Um, <laughs> I, I actually went to a high school um, that was named after a guy whose name was Frederick Ulysses Connard. Um, and they were going to call the football team the Knights. <laughs> And then somebody realized, wait, this is <laughs> <laughs> So we became the chieftains. And now I suppose that's politically incorrect. I don't know if it's still that way or not. <laughs> but anyway, there's this baptism and there's a description. Now suppose, uh, yeah, let's think about whether this description would have to be unique. What are some cases where a name is introduced by this description? Not actually ostending the object. <clears throat> well, here would be a case. Maybe the object doesn't even exist yet, right? So I'm writing a novel. And somebody says, oh, what's the name of this novel? And I give them the name, but it doesn't exist, right? It's something that I'm planning to write, maybe, but I haven't actually written the word. Well, in that case, you might say, I'm doing it by description, the, the novel I'm writing. Uh, but suppose I'm actually working on two novels at the time. Then we might say, that doesn't actually uniquely identify anything. Does, have I succeeded in introducing this name? that I've given you for the novel I'm planning to write, but really, I'm planning to write two. Now, one thought would be, wait a minute. Um, I don't know which of these has that name, right? So actually, the name feels indeterminate here. Is it that one or this one, if you're really planning to write two novels? Um, on the other hand, you might think, no, that succeeds, because after all, it will emerge in the fullness time, of time, at least if you ever write them that one of them has that name, and so that's the one that was being referred to. So I, I find myself uncertain about, about this. Um, a, a case that Kripke talks about 
involves the planets, where initially Neptune was not something they observed, but they hypothesized that Neptune must be there because of irregularities in the orbits of other planets. And in that case, you might say, look, Neptune is the planet that's causing these irregularities. Um, is that something that uniquely identifies Neptune? Well, has it happened? Yes. Um, but you might imagine that they actually find two planets that are jointly <laughs> causing these irregularities. And in that case, what would we say? Have we established the referent of the name Neptune? Yeah, my own intuition is not, right? I mean, maybe if one of them is exerting a lot more influence than the other, but if they're roughly equal, we'd want to say, oh, actually, there are two, so there is no Neptune. There are really there are two. But I find myself wanting to use scare quotes here. There are two Neptunes, because no one planet is doing that. So I think whether this has to be unique is something that Kripke doesn't say a lot about here and would have to be really thought about hard to see what one ought to say in that case. Like, what if you were said you're going to name your child this, but you didn't know you were going to have twins? Exactly, another similar case. Or, you know, yeah, we, 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 we think it's going to be a girl, so we're going to name her Elizabeth, and then it turns out to be twins. Um, might still be easy if one's a girl and one's a boy. You could say, well, yeah, we're not going to call the boy Elizabeth. But, but maybe it's not so easy, or maybe, uh, you know, you think... Um, or maybe you've picked out a name that isn't really gendered, like we're going to name the baby Terry, and then it's like, oh, that works just fine for a boy or a girl. So in short, there are lots of things where you might say, hmm, I don't know what to say about this. Um, and a lot is going to depend on social conventions and assumptions in the background about typical reference of names and so on and so forth. And so you might end up thinking, look, it's a kind of complicated question, and it's kind of a sociological question about whether you've succeeded in naming that description it might depend on the conventions that are in the background. And so I'm inclined to think that in this sort of case, um, typically you would say, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> right? If they're twins, especially if they're identical twins, now which one is Elizabeth? Something's gone wrong, right? And it would be weird to say, well, we'll name this one Elizabeth and that one Terry. And oh, all the way along we were really referring to Elizabeth. We didn't know Elizabeth had this other. And that seems very weird, right? Um, so it doesn't, as in the novel, it seems like later what happens can somehow help establish the name and make it seem legit in the first place. But in the twin case, identical twin case, it doesn't seem like that at all. So I think it's, I think there's a lot you'd have to think about to really figure out how this goes. And it's part of the reason maybe Kripke's worried that this moment, the moment I write this down carefully, it's going to look bad too, <laughs> for many of the same reasons. But anyway, there's initially this baptism. And now what happens? There are transfers. And so the name gets transferred from one person to another. Somebody is using the name to refer, and then somebody else picks up the usage from them. So here, too, there's a lot that we can say about this. What happens here? Well, the use of the name gets transferred from this person, let's say, or from a whole community to this person. At one point, he seems to act as if the transfer is kind of one-to-one, -one, and at some point it's really by virtue of being part of a community um, that this happens. So maybe it really is required, again, that we have kind of a social group here using the name, or maybe not. But in any, of, in any case, these people are referring. So what has to be the case here that, that, that the, the reference is appropriately transferred? In the end, we want to be able to say this person uses the name N and refers to a certain object, what has to be the case here? Well, they have to be using the name N, right? And they also have to be referring to that object. And then what conditions on transfer do we want to apply? Again, Kripke doesn't say a lot about this. And, and by the way, I should say, you know, is it really the same name? Think about a case where you go where you're a, an anthropologist, let's say, and you go to a, a foreign culture for the first time, uh, in the sense that nobody from your culture has gone there before, and the natives have various names for places, for example, for rivers and so on, and you now want to express those names in your language. You might, 
just call them exactly what the natives call them. But often what people do is they find a close equivalent in their own home language that's much more natural there. And so think about European cities, for example. I mean, we don't have to think about a jungle linguist type of situation. Um, Rome is not called Rome in Italy. What is it called? Roma. Roma, yeah. Uh, Paris isn't called Paris, right? In Paris, it's called Paris, <laughs> etc. Uh, yeah. A lot of students, international students, come, let's say, from Korea or something, might have like a name that would be, say, Jung Woo or whatever. And you come here and you might pick an American, an American name, you know, Tom or something. I don't know. Right, right, exactly. Is that, the, I mean, would that, is that the same idea, the same thing? Yeah, the, I think it's very much the same thing. Where you Now, actually, well, I should be careful here. Because sometimes it is meant to be kind of an equivalent to the original name in the new language. Right. But sometimes it's just totally different, right? My old name was blah, 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 blah. And now my new name is, name is going to be Jack. And it's not because Jack is the closest thing I can think of in English that sounds like my old name. It's just, hey, i got a new language to pick a name from. I'll just pick a new name. And so sometimes, I guess the point here is that it's not always exactly the same end. It is among speakers of the same language, typically. But I'm going to put a little star here to indicate this might change in some way. And one way in which it might change is that I'm just trying to find something that would be difficult to pronounce in my language. The why Roma would be difficult to pronounce. I have no idea, right? <laughs> that seems pretty easy to pronounce. Um, but I find something more natural in my language. But sometimes you're right. It could be something that's radically different. I'm establishing the usage here. Um, <clears throat> but that's awfully difficult to say, and so I, I come up with something else. Um, Steve Phillips and I were once working on this uh, edited collection uh, of works that included a lot of Indian philosophy. And there was a particular work whose Sanskrit name is very long and very difficult for an English speaker to both remember and say. And uh, it was been translated as something like the ornament illuminating the uh, sources and means of knowledge. And so I suggested, call it the chandelier of knowledge. <laughs> he, he thought that was ridiculous and refused. <laughs> but nevertheless, I was in effect proposing that we take that name, even as translated, and turn it into something that would be a little more elegant in English. And uh, he you know, said, no, 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 that's Every scholar of Indian philosophy would laugh at me for having agreed to that. Um, so there are presumably bounds on what you can do here. But as in the case of names of people, when you go to a different culture, often they become very, very different. But there's some relation in short between those names. Yeah? Well, there's also like the thing about like within your own culture, your name changing because people like, have, are either born with some name that they don't like, and then as soon as they get a team, they're like, bam, changing it. Or like, if a woman gets married and takes her husband's last name, then like, that's a completely different like, name to reference the same person. Yes. OK, good. Um, that can happen even within the same culture. You're absolutely right. Um, I, I've known various people who, at times in the past, were, were um, you know, called one thing and then later called something else. Sometimes it's very obviously related, like somebody who went by Bob as a kid and now insists on Robert. Um, or it can sometimes be more radical. Um, my uncle um, goes by the name Skin. <laughs> um, and you might think, well, wait, who named a child? Yeah. There was a baptism where they named the baby Skin? <laughs> um, no, at one point he shaved his head. And so people jokingly called him Skinhead, or Skin for short. And he hated his given name, which was, I think, Wilbur. And so to this day, he goes by Skin. <laughs> um, That's awful. That is so yeah, which is worse. Awful. <laughs> awful. <laughs> yeah, part, I mean, part of the joke, part of the reason he thinks it's funny that it's short for Skinhead is that he's African-American. And so it's kind of like, wait, you know, calling him a Skinhead is... But, but anyway, uh, he's now in his 70s and long retired. Uh, but it's still sort of funny when you hear the full story. Anyway, yes? I have, I have a cousin who's American. She married a Greek man. They had a son who culturally they were supposed to name Hercules because that's, that's 
her father-in-law's name. So if you have a son, whatever. Anyway, so my cousin refused to call a kid Hercules. <laughs> because that, I mean, that would be really hard. Uh, right, right. <laughs> so his name's Sam. But his middle name was Hercules. <laughs> oh, that's right, that's right, right. And it made me want, so that whole thing made me wonder, like, you know, what, okay, so his middle name's Hercules. What does that refer to? You know what I mean? Right, right. Well, <laughs> um, actually, I mean, as the person's middle name or just in isolation? Because often, if we just sort of take somebody's middle name, um, yeah, it's, it would be weird to call somebody that. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and so what does Hercules refer to? Um, now notice, in this story, it's going to depend on an initial baptism. And so if the child was baptized, say I'm Hercules, such and such, then I suppose we could say the reference succeeds because of this. Um, on the other hand, if nobody's ever called the child that, it does seem weird, right? And so one of the things we're going to talk about when we get to Gareth Evans' critique of this is to say, look, a lot depends on those kinds of social usages that seem both independent of the initial baptism and also independent of any specific transfer of information. It's not like at some point something went wrong or something screwed up. It's just that if, if somebody's named Hercules initially and then nobody uses that name, you might think that eventually it just stops referring. And Maybe it could even start referring to something else. And right. so on. Yeah, I, I feel like a good example would be Prince because he had like his original name, and then he became Prince, and he was like the artist formerly known as Prince. Yes, like, right. Symbols, like, just, whatever. Yeah, it's just I don't even yeah, know. Yeah, yeah um, this is yeah, last year. Yeah. Yeah. I, right. That is a very interesting case. Um, why did he become known as the well, the artist formerly known as Prince? I think it was copyright issues. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, record contracts, they often, like, you often sign up and agree for a certain fee to produce a certain number of albums. And then, he be, you know, the first album became phenomenally successful. And all of a sudden, he was tied to this contract, which basically forced him to produce subsequent albums almost for free for the record company. And so the, there was a big lawsuit over it, and this was his way of getting around it. He no longer could do it as Prince, but he could do it as the artist, formerly known as Prince. I think eventually they settled, and he started going by Prince again. Some people were joking, he's really now the artist formerly known as the artist formerly known as Prince. <laughs> in any case, yeah, I mean, th those kinds of things can happen, and there is, in this case, not exactly the same name, but there's something that establishes some link between the uses of those names, so we should be careful to allow that. Also keep in mind, at some point here, yes, I get the usage of the name from this usage, but these people better be intended right, to actually use the name to refer to that object and pass that usage on to me. What if they don't? Um, so there must be a certain kind of intention here. Again, it would be complicated to spell it out precisely. <clears throat> but here's the kind of case I have in mind. Um, actually, real life case uh, from my family. Um, my father had two brothers, one older and one younger. The older brother liked to make fun of the youngest brother. And so when he got a dog, and it was a pretty obnoxious little fat dog, um, it was constantly doing inappropriate things. Anyway, um, the older brother, Sam, called his obnoxious dog Nick, which was also the name of the younger brother. Okay. <laughs> um, now he didn't, it, suppose you pick up the use of the, the term Nick here, right? Um, from that, well, he's in in this case, his usage, for example, was uh, was actually for the dog, not for his younger brother, and so you've picked up the use of the term Nick, but now it's referring. To, well, what is it referring to? Here, originally, it's referring to the brother, but then he thinks, <laughs> "I'll call my dog that," and so now, when you use the term Nick, it seems like it's referring to the dog, right, not to the original brother. Uh, you might not even know he had a brother named Nick. Um, or what are some other cases like that, where you use a real person's name, but you use it to, you know, for something else, something it wasn't originally intended for? Authors. Like, a lot of, a lot of <laughs> scholars refer to a body of work just by the name of the author. Oh, right, there are those kinds of usages, yeah. So, so yeah, do you find this in Shakespeare? And somebody said, well, only a surgeon would know. <laughs> they mean Shakespeare's works, they don't mean Shakespeare. So yeah, that's a case where 
the intention there is not to use it to refer to the person any longer, but to a body of work that person produced. Yeah. Oh, like Barbara Streisand, like the Barbara Streisand effect. Oh, Barbara Streisand effect. Very good. Um, yeah, are you intending to refer to Barbara Streisand there? Um, I mean, you, what is the Barbara Streisand effect for somebody who explained for those who don't know? So a while back, uh, images of Barbara Streisand's new house sort of like leaked through, and she vehemently wanted to hide them. And the action of her trying to hide it online made her house more well known. So the Barbara Streisand effect is the more you try to hide something, the more evident, more public it will become. Exactly, exactly. So you might say, suppose somebody refers to a situation like this where somebody's trying to keep something hush hush, but by very, the very act of doing it, they're actually drawing publicity to it. You might say, whoa, that's a Barbara Streisand. And you're not referring, right, to the singer. You're, you, what, that? That event is somehow making music? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, it's, I'm referring to the effect, uh, not actually the singer in that case. Um, now, you notice if I say the Barbara Streisand effect, it feels as if I'm still using the name to refer to her. But if I just say, whoa, that's a Barbara Streisand, then, and that, that's sort of short for the effect, then the name there really does seem to be referring to the effect, not to does, the. Does first. this sort of like relation have to the sort of like. I don't want to say poison, but sort of like affect the connotations of the original name. Because, like, for example, you, know, you call your annoying dog Nick, and so then therefore, like, the like the name Nick kind of like becomes poisoned almost. Same with Barbara Streisand. You can't say Barbara Streisand without thinking of the whole Barbara Streisand like tobacco and whatnot. So, like, is that a thing? Oh, all right. Now that raises an interesting question too. Suppose. I mean, here we don't have any real descriptive content floating along, right? If we say to this person, so what's the descriptive content in your mind? They might not have any, okay? They just heard that person tell a joke about Nick, and it seemed to be funny, and everybody laughed. They thought, I'll tell a joke about Nick. I don't know who Nick is or what Nick is. I have no idea what the referent of the name is. I just know that if you mention the name Nick, people laugh. And so they do that. Who are they referring to? Well, they may have no descriptive content here, right? At the most, they have some descriptive content about the name. The use of this name makes people laugh, so I'll use it. <laughs> but they have no views at all about Nick. Now, that's okay according to this theory. And yet, you might think, wait a minute. At a certain point, let's say part of the descriptive content of the, uh, that most people associate with the name Barbara Streisand does include this effect. Then, you might think, actually, that's in some way shaping, right? what that name is doing in English. I think Shakespeare is a more obvious example where you might say, look, at a certain point, especially in an English course or something, it's so often used to refer to the body of work rather than to the individual who wrote it um, that actually Shakespeare is, you know, most of the time the descriptive content is associated with the body of work. In which case, is it still referring to the person? Notice here it can't really change. Initially, people use the name William Shakespeare or Barbara Streisand to refer to the baby. It gets passed on, and so that's what you're initially referring to. But you might think, wait a minute, if the descriptive content changes enough, and we start referring to a body of work, which we could do in Streisand's case too, or we start referring to some effect or something else like that that gets associated with the name, then we end up thinking, wow, this is something that, well, has shifted in some way. And it's referent. Uh, and if that's the case, then somehow this is still playing a role. So part of what we're going to do when we get to Evan's paper is see that he, he basically says what we need is a hybrid of these two theories. Because now descriptive content seems to play no role at all, but that seems wrong. Yeah? It, it's a bit more of a stretch, but is it kind of the same as um, like, sort of like copyright phrases and copyright names slipping into the vernacular and like companies like spending millions and millions trying to lobby and trying to keep their copyright and whatnot. Oh, examples. all right, yes, good, good, good. So Xerox or Kleenex are good examples of this, right? Where initially, that's a specific company and that's trademarked. But people then start saying, oh, hand me a Kleenex. And it, it, it doesn't matter what company produced that tissue, they just start referring to that as a Kleenex. Or similarly, Xerox becomes a verb. Oh, Xerox that. Um, I don't know if that's still, maybe that's now dying out because nobody has a Xerox machine anymore. <laughs> um, but, but now we, you know, but for a long time, Xerox something really just became the generic term for photocopying. And a Xerox machine really didn't have to be made by the company Xerox. It was something that everybody understood to be just, oh, any copier. And so 
Um, it's easy for terms to start being used that way. And what's happened there? The initial baptism clearly was for a specific company. And yet at some point, the reference shifts to being something much more generic, where a Kleenex or a Xerox machine um, or Xeroxing becomes something much broader than it started out being. And on this model, too, it's sort of hard to see how that happens. How could that occur, really, unless at some point somebody's, well, you could say somebody forms a different intention, kind of like the dog with Nick. And yet, there was no one point where we could trace that, right? It was not like somebody said, uh -huh, I will introduce a new use of the term. Even though this is a canon photocopy, I'm going to say that I'm Xeroxing something. Ha! All right, there was no initial thing like that. Presumably, I mean, maybe there was a point at first in time where somebody did it, but it just gradually evolved. It was not like you see a clear point where, aha, here is where the break occurred. And so, in cases like that, you might say, um, yeah, you know, it's hard to capture how a reference could actually end up shifting on this model. Are there other things we would need to fill in to make sense of this theory? Notice it does have a recursive structure. We're basically saying there are these initial base case circumstances of naming for the first time. And then it's a question of naming getting transferred. And so what ends up establishing the reference of the name? It's really a chain of these transfers back to an initial baptism. So now, here you are, let's say, using a name like Feynman. And what explains that? How do we know that refers to Feynman? Well, we've got this chain going back, and I'm doing it purposely fuzzily, not just because I am fond of abstract art, but because it would be very hard to spell this chain out precisely, right? Figure out exactly where you got the, your use of the name and where they got, and so on and so forth. But eventually, we come back to baby Feynman, and baby Feynman's parents, and the initial baptism, the initial naming ceremony. And the thought is that as long as all the chains, all the links in the chain are good, and as long as it goes back to this, the idea is that all of those really are referring to the same person. Okay, now, we've already identified some issues we have to think about. And so we don't have much time left, so we're going to postpone a real treatment of them until next time. But what are some issues we have to figure out? We've noticed one thing. Reference change. How do we explain that? Because that sort of thing can happen, right? Um, as with, well, Nick or Shakespeare or Barbara Streisand, or Xerox, et cetera, et cetera. What are some other issues that we have to figure out here? Well, one was this role of descriptions in so we could say, we have to figure out what's going on with descriptive baptisms. <clears throat> A third issue was this question of intentions. Um, presumably, actually, I, I knew a philosopher who named his cat metaphysics. Okay. <laughs> That wasn't in his, well, it was a name for a branch of philosophy, but it was also the name of his cat. Um, and so there are these questions of intention and how to characterize the intention that's required in these transfers. And maybe there are other conditions on a successful transfer, too. So we need to think hard about that. We need to think about this question of related names, where it's not the initial name, but nevertheless, <coughs> There's enough of a link that we say, ah, I'm getting my usage of this term from your usage of that term. You know, my use of Rome from your use of Roma. Um, or <clears throat> my use of the chandelier of knowledge from your blah, 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 blah. Now I forget the actual original Sanskrit name. But those are cases where you could say, yeah, we've got to spell this out. Are there other issues you can identify that we've got to figure out? Yeah. I mean, this is kind of going along with intention, but kind of like the metacommunicative differences, right? So like if your parent calls you by your first name versus by your first, middle, and last name, like you know you're in trouble, versus, versus like if your parent just calls oh. you by your first name, they're just calling you over for whatever. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a really good point. Um, there are, yeah, what you call that metacommunicative, and I like that way of putting it. This is a way of thinking, look, by my use of that name for you, I'm actually communicating something, right? Um, and yeah, when my wife get a, gets angry at a cat, she uses the cat's name, but Bonavac is his last name. Um, so it's not just, you know, Banks. It's Banks Bonavac. And that's, you know, Banks has done something terrible. Um, and <clears throat> so that sort of thing, how is that possible, right? If we don't have descriptive content playing any role here, um, you might say, well, it's playing some role, it's just not playing the role of determining the referent. Um, after all, it's the same cat. It's not like Binks Bonavac and Binks refer to different cats. Nevertheless, it does convey different information. We could also have cases where we think, you know, well, actually, at some point here, we talked about the, the names and the fact that certain names might or might not have a sort of gendered significance to them. And that, too, is sort of background sociological information about how we go about determining what's going on. So there is this sort of um, the role of background information. A lot of this is going to have to do with general usages in the community. But some of it might not. Um, some of it might be much more specific than the general society, though a lot might have to do with that. There might be some sub-community that is using things in a way that plays a crucial role in the naming process that wouldn't even be recognized in the larger social group. And so, and those things can change over time. And so as those sort of social attitudes in the background and assumptions change, that may affect the way certain names get used, and that may affect reference and so on. And so all of those are things we'd have to think hard about too. Any other points that bother you? That we think to make this a real theory of names, we better be precise about all these things. So far we've really just got this vague picture. Oh, think of it this way. But all of these things are really going to have to be spelled out precisely if we're to have a real theory. Yeah? And this is for Blonsman. I tended to say like circles and Frege in there, and like, like say like you know different names have sort of like different senses. Ah, so what would be an example? Like for example, for me, I have like three names. I have like I have my English name, I have my formal Chinese name, then I have the like nickname that my family uses. But then in addition to that, I have an online handle, and they all refer to the same person, but in different senses. Ah, oh, okay, yes, right. <clears throat> so good. I'm not sure whether to say senses or contexts there, but, <clears throat> but yes, there are going to be different names that are the appropriate name for an object in a different context. So online, you might be this. You might blog under a certain name, then you're that. Here is your original Chinese formal name. Here's your informal name. Here is the English name. Um, <clears throat> and uh, all of those things might be sort of going. And then you might write things under a pen name and, and so on. Right? So all of those things might appropriately refer to you, but on the other hand, can only be used, you might say, successfully as a name for you in certain kinds of contexts. So some names might be contextually tied. Yeah? What about uh, some words, I forget what the grammar term is, but words that kind of come from the natural sound, like if you mean buzz, like bees buzz. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like buzz. Uh, oh, right, okay, so certain kinds of, uh, yeah. They don't seem to be baptized. In the same way. That's that's right. Some some examples like that, there doesn't seem to be an initial baptism. It just gets picked up uh, by some sort of natural link. And so, uh, yeah, all of those are issues we'll talk about next time. We'll discuss Gareth Evans' paper on the causal theory of names. We'll look at um, Kripke's third lecture on Friday.